A Zen monk preaches the Dharma to a small gathering of friends and devotees, while marveling at the luxury of having his own 16 by 20 foot room to serve as a meditation hall. A haiku poet proudly sees four of his six sons leave to become soldiers, but also openly supports a conscientious rap resistance movement. A three volley rifle salute honors the death of a World War I soldier whose service earned him the rare privilege of formally naturalizing as an American citizen despite his status as an Asian immigrant. When we talk about the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, it's easy to lose track of the Issei, who were the immigrants who left Japan to become the first generation of Japanese Americans. When the war started, the average age for an Issei was somewhere around 50 years old. And the fact that immigrants of Asian origin were legally barred from becoming American citizens, it meant that they were disenfranchised and often sidelined by the administration of the camps. Discussions of the Issei's experience often focus on the losses that they suffered, which were significant. They lost the jobs and homes that they had carefully built for themselves in a country that was actively hostile to them due to the anti-Asian racism of the times. They lost their sense of independence and their status as community and family leaders because the American-born second generation was coming of age and their citizenship status meant that the administration of the camps in particular often turned to them for leadership. Alternatively, some people, when they discuss the Issei, focus on their role as keepers of Japanese traditions and culture at a time when assimilation was forcefully encouraged. These narratives are all true and they're all important. But at the same time, it's easy to forget that the Issei were also the generation that was American by choice, even if many of them never got the chance to become so legally. And when you look at the Issei through the lens of an entire generation, it's easy to lose track of the vitality and genius of so many individuals that made up this trailblazing first generation. So today, let's take a look at three of those individuals, Nyogen Senzaki, Satoru Tsuneishi, and Clarence Hachiro Una. Three Issei incarcerated at Heart Mountain who embraced their life as Americans. Nyogen Senzaki was a monk who played a pivotal role in the adaptation of Zen to American culture. In a letter that he wrote to a friend during his time at Heart Mountain, Senzaki wrote that, I came into this country as an immigrant 37 years ago. I determined from the beginning to stay in this country the rest of my life. America is my adopted country. When he lived in Japan, Senzaki had been increasingly uncomfortable with the growing militarization of the country, and particularly of the Buddhist priesthood, as they aligned themselves with the imperial government. Senzaki had been orphaned as an infant and adopted by the Senzaki family, who named him Senzaki Aizo. His foster grandfather was a priest at a Pure Land temple, but he warned the 16-year-old Senzaki away from the priesthood. However, Senzaki discovered Zen while studying for a medical degree and eventually decided to become ordained at a Soto Zen temple. The name Nyogen, which means like a phantasm, was given to him on his ordination. Senzaki became the disciple of the Rinzai Zen priest Soyen Shaku, but his studies were interrupted by a dangerous bout of tuberculosis that forced him to leave the temple and return to his hometown to recuperate. While he was there, he dedicated himself to running something that he called a mentor garden, where children could play and learn about manners and about nature. Unfortunately, Senzaki was also outspoken against the Buddhist clergy because he felt that they had abandoned their spiritual responsibilities for secular power. He also spoke out against the rising militarism of Japanese society as a whole. Both stances were unpopular, which made gathering funding for his mentor garden difficult, especially when Japan's war with Russia led to an economic crisis in 1904. Then, in 1905, Senzaki's teacher, Soyen Shaku, was invited to travel to San Francisco to visit with Ida Russell, 
one of the first American adherents of Zen. He invited Senzaki to come with him. However, when Soyan Shaku returned to Japan, Senzaki did not go with him. According to one account, Soyan brought Senzaki his bags and told him, This may be better for you than being my attendant monk. Just face the great city and see whether it conquers you or you conquer it. However, he forbade Senzaki to teach Zen for another 17 years to make up in experience what he'd missed in training. So, for nearly two decades, Senzaki lived as many poor Japanese immigrants did. He worked as a dishwasher, as a houseboy, a laundryman, clerk, manager, and briefly even as the partial owner of a Japanese hotel. In order to reclaim the anonymity that he considered an important part of being a monk, he grew his hair out and stopped wearing his robes. He even studied social dancing in an effort to be a properly American gentleman. But he would also study at any available moment, and he would go do zazen, sitting meditation, in Golden Gate Park. Then, in 1922, the prescribed 17 years were up, and Senzaki began teaching. He would hold lectures on Buddhism whenever he could save enough money to rent a hall or a room, so he called that his floating zendo. And over time, he gathered several students. In 1931, he moved to Los Angeles, and he continued to gather students and was becoming increasingly popular until 1942, when the war hysteria on the West Coast following the attack on Pearl Harbor led to every person of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast being forcibly removed and placed in confinement camps in the interior of the country. Senzaki was sent to Heart Mountain in Northwest Wyoming. At Heart Mountain, Senzaki shared a barrack room with a family of three, a couple and their daughter. His time was largely occupied with teaching, writing, and reflection. In a letter that he wrote in December 1943, he described his life as, every morning a Buddhist monk meditates for 40 minutes and recites sutras for 30 minutes, wherever he is. Like birds in the woods, some people who love silence or like to read old scriptures join him with no invitation needed. After the service is over, some ask him questions about the sutras, and he responds for about 30 minutes more. I lived for 12 years in Los Angeles in the same way. My visitors are usually from the intellectual classes, and they never make a crowd. The visitors bring their own chairs or sit on the floor. Ten or twelve of them enjoy the tranquility of their contemplation. They are the happiest and most contented evacuees in this center. In fact, Senzaki claimed that he found life in the Heart Mountain camp almost too luxurious, given that he had housing and food available. He even claimed that Heart Mountain was well suited to Zen practice. All of the demons would freeze to death in the winter wind. Eventually, Senzaki was assigned a barrack room for himself, 16 by 20 feet. However, he chose to continue living with the couple, and instead he converted his assigned barrack room over into a zendo or a meditation hall, where he and his students could gather. Senzaki claimed he had no interest in proselytizing Zen in the camp, which was consistent with how he had always approached religious education. However, he was an active part of religious life in the camp outside of his zendo. He didn't advertise himself as a teacher, but he did perform funeral services, and he assisted with things like the Buddhist Sunday schools and with festivals like Obon that were held in the camp. He also regularly contributed philosophical essays to the camp's Japanese language literature magazine. Then, in September 1945, after the exclusion orders blocking Japanese Americans from the West Coast were lifted, Senzaki returned, first to Pasadena, California, where his student Ruth McCandless lived. She was taking care of his Buddhist texts for him. And then he returned to Los Angeles to start the process of founding a zendo all over again. He remained in Los Angeles for the rest of his life until he passed away on May 7, 1958, at the age of 82. Senzaki arrived in the United States when he was approximately 30 years old knowing very little English, and he lived the rest of his life here. He only returned to Japan once in his life, a short visit in 1955 to visit his friend Soen Nakagawa, 
a fellow monk with whom Senzaki had traded letters for years. Nyogen Senzaki's embrace of the United States as his home extended to and was an extension of his practice of Zen. He preferred an egalitarian mentorship with his students rather than the strict hierarchy of formal temples. He also adjusted his zendo to American customs, for example, allowing students to sit in chairs rather than having them kneel in the traditional manner. Indeed, his modernization and expansion of traditional Zen practices is one of his great legacy. With regards to his life in the United States, Yogen Senzaki wrote that, Buddhism is an ethical teaching based on pure reason, independent of any tradition or the legends of any particular country or race. William James's pragmatism, a well-known interpretation of true Americanism, is nearest in thought to Buddhism. If I can help America to have fewer liars, cheaters, and gold demons, if I can do my bit to improve her people's behavior and intellectual progress, that alone is something worthwhile. Others also found spirituality and philosophy in the United States as well. Satoru Tsuneishi was the oldest son of a small farming family, and he came to the United States in 1907 at the age of 19 with his best friend. He soon converted to Christianity and sought out an education with the goal of becoming a minister. He completed high school and also finished one year at University of Southern California. However, he ultimately decided that he didn't have the financial means to become a minister. And so, like many other Japanese immigrants, he turned to farming as a lifestyle. But he always treasured his education. He married a school teacher from his hometown in Japan, and they always kept a newspaper and an encyclopedia in their house. They also had 10 children, although one of them died in infancy. The oldest of their children was almost 30 on the day of Pearl Harbor while the youngest surviving child was 12. Originally, the family raised chickens for a living, but that business went under, and they ultimately had to turn to truck farming with berries and vegetables to get through the Depression. However, in some circles, Satoru Tsuneishi was better known as Shisei Tsuneishi, Shisei being the pen name he used as a haiku poet. In 1977, he was granted an Order of the Rising Sun by the Emperor of Japan in recognition of his lifelong efforts to promote the art of haiku in the United States. Before the war, Tsuneishi was in charge of selecting haiku submissions to run in the Japanese language California newspaper, Kashu Mainichi Shimbun. He was also a member of the Tachibana Haiku Society. After the war, he was an honorary member of Japan's premier haiku magazine, the Hototo Gisu. And he had ambitions to publish three haiku in it, which he didn't quite achieve in the end. One of his major projects when he was confined in the Heart Mountain camp at, in Wyoming was running a haiku society within the camp for Issei and Japanese-speaking Nisei. He also acted as the haiku editor for the Japanese language literary magazine. In addition, like Nyogen Senzaki, he frequently contributed his own additional pieces including a free verse poem meditating on the mountain itself and an introduction to haiku interpretation. Tsuneishi was also active in the Heart Mountain community. In fact, he served as a chairman on the committee for his block in Heart Mountain. And he served so well that when he tried to resign, his block held a vote of confidence supporting him. When Heart Mountain put together a judicial committee, he was chosen to serve as his block's representative. He also served as secretary for the judo school, and he helped to organize the allotment of victory garden space for the people in camp who wanted to grow supplemental food. However, Tsuneishi's most significant involvement was also the most controversial. By the end of the war, four of Tsuneishi's six living sons had either volunteered or been drafted into the army. His fifth son was called, but failed his physical exam. Tsuneishi's oldest son had in fact been recruited before Pearl Harbor by the Army's Japanese language training program. The sixth of his sons, the youngest, actually served in the Vietnam War later. But Tsuneishi himself was a pacifist. Not only that, he advocated openly on behalf of Heart Mountain's Fair Play Committee, which was the only organized draft resistance movement in the camps. 
the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee encouraged young men in the camp to sign a declaration stating that they were willing and able to serve if called up by the draft, but refused to do so unless their rights as citizens were recognized and restored. A total of 88 young men refused to respond and were convicted of draft evasion. 63 of them were convicted in a single trial. This draft resistance movement left a deep scar in the Japanese American community. The resistors saw themselves as loyal Americans defending their constitutional rights. But many members of the Japanese American community felt that by refusing to serve, the resistors were supporting that narrative that Japanese Americans are disloyal and that's why they have to be put in these camps in the first place. However, some people did work to bridge that gap. Tsuneishi's son, Paul Tsuneishi, actually served in the army and then he later became a minister, achieving the dream his father had once had. Paul Tsuneishi was an early member of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, and when the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center was being built, he was a fierce advocate to see that the story of the Fair Play Committee was told sympathetically, in part because Paul Tsuneishi sympathized with his father's support for the Fair Play Committee. Regarding the resistance movement, Tsuneishi the Elder wrote, Since I am an alien enemy, I am not in a position to express my opinions on the policy of the War of the United States, but when I was young, I went to American schools for several years and learned about American history, as well as the Constitution of the United States. I know why the colonists revolted against England. The Nisei also know about them. I can understand why some of them refused to serve in the American army while rights of citizenship have been denied to them, and they have been put into concentration camps without doing anything wrong. After the war ended, Satoru Tsuneishi returned to farming strawberries. He also continued to pursue his interests in poetry and literature. In 1976, a year before he received the Emperor's Award, he helped translate some of his haiku for a dramatic haiku reading titled Dandelion in the Wind meant to be presented in mixed Japanese and English, telling the story of the war and the incarceration of the Japanese Americans. Tsuneishi passed away in 1987, not long after Congress formally recognized that the incarceration of the Japanese Americans was the result of war hysteria and racism, rather than military necessity. Not all, you say, who walked into the Heart Mountain camp walked out again. In January of 1943, approximately a thousand people gathered to witness the funeral of a military veteran, complete with a three-volley rifle salute and honors paid by legionnaires from Cody and Powell, as well as Hart Mountain. The veteran in question was Clarence Uno, who had fought in the American army during World War I and, as a result, had been one of the very few Issei to earn the right to naturalize as an American citizen. Uno was born as Hachiro Uno in 1895 as one of nine or ten children. Their father had converted to Christianity to marry their mother and didn't own much property. They were harassed in Japan for being Christian and also didn't have many prospects for inheritance. So ultimately, almost all of the Uno children eventually came to the United States, either temporarily or permanently. Hachiro Uno came to the United States in 1911, when he was 15 years old, at the invitation of a relative. This was after the 1907 Gentlemen's Agreement, which blocked immigration from Japan except for family members. Originally, Uno worked in a nursery for his relative. However, in 1918, Clarence Uno volunteered to join the army to fight in World War I. He was not the only one in his family to do so. His brother, George Komemoto Uno, had also volunteered but George was rejected because he had children to take care of. Clarence Uno completed his training and sailed with the American Expeditionary Force to France in August of 1918. He served in the army for approximately a year before being discharged honorably in June of 1919. A few years later, he moved to Ogden, Utah, where he opened a general merchandise store. He also married his wife, Osaka Teroka, there, and they had three children. In addition to his shop, Uno's fluency in English meant that he had an important role in the Japanese immigrant community, especially in helping Issei dealing with legal issues. 
He also helped to establish the Ogden Japanese Union Church. Then, in 1935, Congress passed an act allowing aliens who would normally be ineligible for citizenship to naturalize if they had served in the army during World War I. Uno applied, and in 1936, he became the first naturalized Japanese immigrant in Utah, and only one of a small handful of Issei to become American citizens before the McCarran-Walter Act of 1952 removed the racial barriers to naturalization. In 1938, the family moved to El Monte, California, where Uno got a job with the San Gabriel Valley Japanese Association. However, that movement that when the decision was made to remove all people of Japanese descent from the West Coast, Clarence Uno and his family were living within that designated exclusion zone. According to an account written in remembrance of Uno, he never complained about being sent to the camps, at least not publicly. He may not have been surprised. Many of the Issei generation had expected that something of the like would probably happen although most of them had hoped that their American-born children, who were legally American citizens, would be spared. At Heart Mountain, Uno threw himself into the life of the camp, particularly regarding activities involved in supporting the war effort. In fact, Clarence Uno was one of the first arrivals at Heart Mountain because his fluency in both English and Japanese and his previous experience helping the immigrant community meant that he was very useful in coordinating with the Issei, many of whom struggled with English. Uno was also the camp's selective service director, which meant he was responsible for making certain that the men in the camp had completed their draft registration and that their addresses had been updated to reflect their move to the Heart Mountain camp. Uno also supported the USO as a representative of the American Legion, and one of the most important things he did was convincing the American Legion representatives of Powell and Cody to come visit Heart Mountain in the hopes that they would vouch for the conditions of the camp in order to counter rumors of coddling that were spreading throughout the outer communities. Uno's support for the American military put him at the heart of a number of controversial issues. Although the draft itself was not instituted in the camps until much later, Many of the concerns that ultimately led to the Heart Mountain's draft resistance movement were already part of the social ferment of the camp. Where many saw answering the draft as a matter of duty, volunteering was a much more difficult decision. The call for volunteers meant that any family with young men found themselves juggling questions of duty to one's country versus duty to one's family with the added strain that many of those young men had initially attempted to volunteer and have been turned away as enemy aliens, despite the fact that they were American citizens. We don't know what Uno himself thought of those questions. However, he continued to actively work to support the USO drives. Then, the night of January 21st, Clarence Uno walked home from one of his USO events, went to bed, and never got up again. Doctors said he suffered a heart attack. He was 48. Clarence Uno's funeral was held with full honors for his military service and attracted a huge crowd. At the same time, it was devastating for his wife Osako. Not only was she left to raise their children alone, but she struggled to reclaim her husband's belongings from where they had been left in storage on the West Coast. Her frustration can be read in her tart remark that she was not willing to volunteer for service with the WAAC because she was a widow supporting three children. In addition, because their home on the West Coast had been attached to Clarence Uno's job, they couldn't go back to it. Eventually, the family moved back to Ogden, where they had relatives, and the youngest son, Raymond Uno, grew up to become Utah's first minority judge and an active defender of human rights. In an article written after Clarence Uno's death, the writer reflected that someone once said a native-born citizen of a nation takes his rights and privileges for granted, while a naturalized citizen, by severing ties with the land of his birth and assuming new loyalties through a voluntary decision, appreciates the advantages of his adopted land. 
Clarence Uno maintained his faith in the United States, despite the American Legion that he himself was a part of, being one of the most vocal advocates for the removal of the Japanese American community in the wake of Pearl Harbor. But the willing adoption of a country does not require the formal legal procedures of citizenship. Satoru Tsune Ishii was well aware of his status as an alien immigrant, but he was also deeply appreciative of the Constitution of the United States and the ideals that it represented. At the same time, he was a strong advocate for the Japanese literary arts in the Japanese American community. Likewise, Nyogen Senzaki saw in the United States a country that's ideals and philosophy supported the ideals of his religion when he felt that Japan itself had turned away from them. Despite having very little English education or job skills when he came to the United States, he never turned away. Each of these men kept their Japanese identities as a monk, as a poet, and as an advocate for the Japanese immigrant community. But at the same time, they made the willing and conscious choice to be American, whether or 